Okay, we're ready. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Chicago Lug. Uh, we're at first. Let's give a round of applause to Carl for getting the recording going. Uh, so we are here to talk about 8sync, uh, and uh, 8sync is a network library I've been working on top of, on top of GNU Guile. Uh, it is a um, built on top of the actor model, which is one way of doing concurrent programming. Um, and in fact, if you go to the 8sync homepage, which is at gnu.org slash software slash 8sync, you can, uh, it has this little snippet of code and it has real running code. In this amount of code, you can write a real IRC bot. Um, huh. and, uh, and that's it. And most of this is actually about it switching between different things, you know. So here it's saying, when I get an action that says bot snack, it says, yay, I do a dance, and et cetera. So um, there is a monitor being rotated in front of me, so maybe I should make uh, sure I just that... keep going. Okay. All right. So anyway, um, but that's just one actor, right? This is just one IRC bot actor. What would be more fun would be having a lot of actors running around. So uh, I ran, was participated in something called the Lisp Game Jam, which is a, uh, um, a game programming contest. Uh, and... Uh, and I built a MUD on top of 8sync, which is a multi-user dungeon. Who here has ever played a text adventure or a MUD type thing? Where's your hand? Okay. Actually, a good chunk of the room has done that type of thing. But if, in case you haven't... What's uh, the URL? The URL. So I'm going to let everybody connect to it in a second. So you can connect if you want. You can pull out your laptop. Now, before you connect, I'm going to say if... I, sometimes when we do these types of things, like it's people start like saying sexist or racist bullshit or like a bunch of other stuff like that. If you're going to do that kind of stuff, just don't connect since it will be recorded. But if you're not going to do that type of stuff, you can connect by going to dustycloud.org uh, 8888, assuming I remember to turn on. Yep, there we go. Um, so we should see people connect. There we go. A bunch of people are connecting. Um, so it's dustycloud.org 8888. Yes. Oh, somebody already figured out how to talk. So you can talk like this. You can either do say foo or you can do um, d double quotes or single quotes, space, and then, you know, hi, everybody. And at this point, we're kind of have, like, a multiplayer chat room. Um, hooray! So, if you type look, uh, oh, somebody already figured out how to ring the bell. So, yeah, somebody <laughs> ring the bell, and uh, a, a uniformed woman rushes into the room. She's wearing a badge that says desk clerk. So, I should give the context of what's happening here. We are in a hotel lobby. That is the state of the game. It's called Hotel Bric-a-Brac. Uh, and there's a bell that says ring bell, uh, terrible music, etc. Um, and, uh, um, and somebody has already rung the bell, summoning the clerk. Um, so what do we do? Uh, we can ask the... Yeah, so if I can <laughs> chat with clerk... Ava's already done this, so she's kind of <laughs> cheating. Um, so, um, you know, it says, so if you need help with anything, you can ask about it. So I want to change my name. So I can do ask clerk about changing name. And she says, oh, you know, change your name's easy. Just say, si they've got a sign in form. So sign form as, and then you put your name. So sign form as C. Weber. And now I'm known as C. Weber. Let's look in the room. We've still got a lot of guests dash whatevers. You can sign the form and switch. What port? Uh, dustycloud.org colon 8888. You can also do forward slash me or emote to do something. Emote does a dance. Yes, exactly. So if we look in the room, we'll see um, some other stuff around. Uh, there is a sign. So I could read the sign, for example. And it says, Hotel Big Brack and Smudge Tasty Text. I can also, uh, um, there says that there is a curio cabinet here. So if I look at cabinet, it says, oh, something catches your eye. A telephone shaped like an orange cartoon cat. Look at cat. Oh, look at phone it's made out of cheap plastic it's orange and it has a striped tabby with you know smarmy looking face somebody probably made a lot of money in the 1990s oh great okay so um don't solve the puzzle body yeah. <laughs> <laughs> body already knows what's going on so there's also a, the desk clerk which uh, the uh um Yes, so the clerk's complaining about the proprietor having no idea how to run a hotel. Well, anyway, if we type help, we'll see that there's other commands. So, for example, um, there's go. So, if I do a look, I can see that to the north, there's some kind of hallway. So, I'm going to go north. And there's already Bonnie here. 
since Vardy has already kind of spo- uh, had a preview of this game. She knows some of the things that's going on. Um, and you can join me. There's Jim. Um, so in this room, we see kind of uh, um, a bunch of statues around and etc. And there is a statue in the middle of the room called uh, Hakthina. I'm gonna, there's also a hotel map, so I'm gonna read the map. And it says, you are here, right in the middle of the lobby, at the, or right in the middle of the hallway. You can also see where the lobby is and these other rooms. Uh, you can move around if you like. So there is a statue of Hakthina. So I'm going to look at statue. Um, Hatch, so this is the statue of Hakthina, guardian of the hacker spirit. Um, she's holding the form of a human woman. She's got, uh, um, holding some sort of keyboard and a shield. So we could look at keyboard. It says that it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a night keyboard, which means that it's a, uh, she must be an, e- an Emacs user. Ava's already picking things up and dropping them. Um, <laughs> look at QB. Oh, wait, Ava already took QB again. Um, okay. so... Um, so if I look at shield, oh, it looks like it's some sort of hard disk platter. It's kind of loose. So what do you think we would do here? Somebody can guess or just do it. Take the shield. shield. You take the shield, a completely separate copy of the disk materializes into our hands and says, share the software and you'll be free. Okay, great. So what do we need to do next? So read sign. Yes. And everybody can take a copy of it if they want, since it makes their own individual copy. And you can type in to see what's in your inventory. Um, so, read sign. Uh, oops, read map. Um, we could go east or west or whatever. Where should we go? Well, where are what people? What room are you in right now? Sir? We're right north of the lobby. Okay. Oh. So, <laughs> why don't we? Uh, um, why don't we go? Well, there's a fun joke. You can go east, and then there's some, some, there's some like table and chairs and stuff like that. And we can go south again. And uh, oh, somebody must have go south. Dismiss clerk. She will go back. And if we go south of the smoking parlor, we'll see that the hotel desk clerk is here. If somebody goes and rings the bell again, she'll run out of here and freak out. Um, <laughs> but Anyway, yep, there we go. Somebody rang the bell. So anyway, the, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that this is a world of objects. Um, everything in here is itself a, its own individual actor under the 8-sync type vision of actors. Um, and uh, it's, I, this whole world is live hackable. So we can actually change things and add things as the world is running. So I'm going to go, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go west of the, the main hallway to the playroom. Now, there's a few things in here, including uh, a toy chest, which has a tinfoil hat in it. So I'm going to take hat from chest, wear hat, and it's a lot harder to take me seriously now. But, you know, so, <laughs> so one of the nice things about this is that we can actually add things and change the world as it goes. Um, so, for example, uh, toy chest. Uh, what's something that somebody would like as a toy? Like a... A frog. A frog. Okay, we'll just make a simple toy, which is a, um, toy frog. So we're going to call this toy, or rubber plastic frog. Frog. A plastic frog. Plastic frog and frog. Plastic, plastic frog with cute its eyes. arm, with cute eyes. eyes. So it's a simple thing. You can take it, but I'm going to insert it. Since this is a, Now, if I was doing a normal programming environment, uh, what I would have to do is um, I would actually have to kind of kill the entire world while this was running in order to be able to... Uh, um, <coughs> Uh, in order to be able to change things as they're running. But I don't have to do that here. So I have this nice thing where I can inject things straight into the game. So I'm going to inject this uh, plastic frog. Oop. All right. Now look at chest. And there is a, a plastic frog in there. Oh, so I see that 
Sheila has already started messing with the Rube Goldrick machine, but somebody mm -hmm. can take that frog if they want now. So now, actually, Sheila's already uncovered a problem with this Rube Goldberg machine. It started, the dominoes toppled down the line, the last domino ran out of the switch, the switch lights a match, the match lights a candle, and the candle burns, and it just stopped. Yeah. What happens, right? I bet you were disappointed, right? Yeah. That's because there's something wrong with the machine, so I'm going to have to fix it. Um, so I'm going to look at the, the machine, the Rube Goldberg machine. Now, the thing that it broke on was the candle. Now, when I look at this candle here, I see that um, I've got this kind of little language that says all the steps that happen. So for example, the, sw the, the switch, it said the switch lights a match and for two thirds of a second it pauses and then it says the, lit sweat, the match lights a candle, one and a half seconds it pauses and then it kicks off the next thing, see? So the same thing here, the candle burns, the candle is, uh, is, and then it's supposed to say the candle is burning away a rope, but I made an error when I programmed this. There's this thing in Lisp where you can switch between you know, one, two, that's writing, adding together one and two and you get three, or you can do something like this. And if you put this quote before it, it actually turns into data. Now we have a list of one and two. Um, and I can do a quasi quote where I do something like this, minus eight and nine. And uh, I'll just switch that plus to elephant. Um, and see that thing that I unquoted here actually performed, <coughs> kind of executed that thing in the middle of it. So it's kind of a mini little listy templating language. And I made a mistake when I programmed this candle where I forgot to unquote this. So it was actually returning a list of slash two, three instead of actually evaluating it and do two divided by three. So I can fix that. Um, I fixed that and uh, I'm going to inject the, um, Injecting things is kind of a mud sink, which is a mud thing. It's not actually an eight sink thing, but you can build these kind of live hacking things on top of there. So I'm going to inject the fixed version of the candle right into the game while it's running. Um, so now <laughs> you found that the elephant inside the fanny pack. Nice job. So um, so I'm going to reset the Rube Goldberg machine. So a, a glove comes out and switches everything back. Whoa. Uh, and then retreats into the wall, and I'm going to run the machine. So I start the Rube Goldberg machine, and hopefully it's fixed. Domino's toppled down the line, last domino hits a switch, switch lights a match, match lights a candle, candle burns, candle's burning away a rope, the rope snaps, snap rope unleashes a catapult which throws a rock, Wop flies through a water demon, the water demon starts spraying water everywhere, the, wa the water hits a quick, the kettle's water <coughs> heat in, the, the quick heater's on button, quick heater fills up, heats up kettle banana, uh, the kettle is filled, the kettle is heated up, the water is boiled, oh, and there's a cup of hot tea. Take tea. Sip tea. How refined. <laughs> I can also just drink the tea, but that'll burn my throat. Uh, but now I have no more tea. Uh, but anyway, but you get the idea. So if you've done any concurrent programming before, you might have run into this issue where like it's actually hard to plan out a concurrent programming environment. And uh, what's really exciting is to be able to actually figure out and evolve the system live while it's running. So. Um, this whole game, pretty much, I actually built while the, the program was running, like the parser and everything. So that's one of the big advantages of AppSync is that you can program things in a networked environment and actually change things around as it goes. So let's go, we're still in this room, in the playroom, but we know West is a computer room, so let's go West. Um, and uh, um, so now let's see if we can solve this puzzle. There's a large computer cabinet um, and there's a large hard drive, and there's a floor, uh, a, a panel on the floor that we'd like to go down into, but it seems to be closed. And that's where my talk is, downstairs. So in order to be able to go to the rest of my talk, we have to solve this puzzle. So let's look at the computer. Uh, large clothes size, closet, closet size, computer labeled PDP 11.5. Um, looks like we could run a program on it. So run program on computer. Ooh, disk error. So we need to somehow uh, fix whatever the disk gear is. So look at drive. So the drive says that it contains a slit where we could, um, oh, and somebody already inserted the Godling platter. So that's done. Somebody solved part of the puzzle. But there's a, a, um, a load button which is, um, which is glowing. So we should probably, oh, Ava figured it out. She <laughs> pressed the button on the hard disk and it begins to spin up and the ready light turns on. So now we can run the program on the computer. Somebody can do that. I'll just I'll just let somebody else do it.
There we go. Ava runs the program on the computer. You hear gears glide, and a metal panel on the uh, platter on the gr uh, um, panel on the ground opens and reveals a stairwell going down. Hooray! Nice job. So let's go down. <coughs> so here's where the main talk is. We're in an underground laboratory, which is the eight sync laboratory. Let's read the map. Oh, nice. It's a nice ASCII art map here. Uh, so to the north is the eight sync hive. We're in some sort of laboratory. To the east of the Federation Station, there's a Guile eight sync museum to the west. Um, some sort of swamp below. Where should we go? Any votes? Go to the swamp? I didn't finish that. It's, uh, it's walled off. Yeah, sorry. That was going to be the best part of the thing. I was going to have frogs in there that you could attack and everything, but I ran out of time. But the other rooms are open, so, uh, yeah, you would be able to punch the frogs. No. What, what about that, like, secret-looking room on the bottom? Oh, oh, pizza's here. Oh, uh, the secret room? This one here? Yeah. Uh, well, we in, we can get there. In order to do that, we have to go into the Async Museum. But maybe, actually, there's one more thing in this room that we should probably look at before we leave it. There is a sign labeled the Async Design Goals. And since this is theoretically a talk yes. about uh, the Async, we should probably read that sign. So read the sign. So what are the goals of Async? So A, it's actor-based. So who here knows what the actor model is? Anybody? One kind of? Uh, a, few, a few kind of yeah. So it's a it's where you send messages. So in the actor model, there are no uh, nobody has a direct reference to anyone else, and there's no shared state. So if you're familiar with like the uh, um, with if you're familiar with any kind of concurrent programming, and you're familiar with dining philosophers, etc., you know that sharing resources is hard. Um, so what uh, the actor model does is each thing that's in the environment actually just sends messages to each other and each actor has an inbox that they read messages out of. Um, so this prevents us from running into deadlocks and etc. Uh, it's also live hackable so the whole because it's so hard to be able to program a concurrent system it should be possible to extend it as you go. Um, and no callback help. So who here has programmed in something like Node.js or Twisted or anything like that? Um, at least yeah a few people here. So you're probably familiar with what callback hell is. You have to call some procedure, which needs to call another procedure, which needs to call another procedure. And eventually you just get like lost, right? It just turns into a bunch of spaghetti. And you try to use promises or something to make it easier, but they only make it so much easier. So uh, in 8sync, what happens is uh, um, there are, So here's an example where uh, if when we were taking things like from that statue, from the taking things from Pactina, we needed to find out, um, we could actually go, I'm going to actually just demonstrate. So when I, I'm going back to the grand hallway, you can do the take shield, but you can also do take shield from Pactina. So I didn't want it to error out no matter which one you did, right? So in order to do that, the Pactina actor needs to be able to ask it's other, like, the actors that it knows about, how do I actually, what names do you go by? So that it can correctly proxy to them, correct? You know? So that makes sense, but uh, how do we prevent that from being a big mess? Um, and the way that we do that so that we don't have to actually split things at all, right here is where we send a message to the other object, and you can send messages that you don't wait on. For example, here we're telling the odd player that they don't see anything here, but if we do see something, um, we can just actually wait on the message. And we'll get back a response, kind of like doing a web server request where you have a request and a response. And our function will suspend mid-execution and be woken up by the scheduler as soon as there's something available. So instead of splitting things into separate functions, you can write a function that moves straight ahead. And in fact, um, uh, the, ex the first example I ever had when I first started working on these things, uh, I wanted to have a robust example that had a warehouse full of a bunch of like droid robots and another robot that had to go through and find out which ones are infected and it had to scan each robot and then if it found it was infected, shoot it until it's dead and then move to the next room. Now if you did that in something like Node.js, you'd have to split that into like 50 functions that you'd have to keep track of and kind of thread between them. This is all one function. So each bit of it actually is able to just the function is able to just suspend mid-execution. That's because we're using something that's really cool in Scheme called delimited continuations to be able to get really nice coroutines. Um, so uh, now that I've dropped um, a huge amount of jargon, um, let's. Request like message at a time. <coughs> 
like oh, so like send it out to a bunch of actors and then kind of collect them. Yeah. Um, so you can. Um, there's uh, uh, there's not quite as much of the easy like wait thing. What you would do is that you'd actually send it to a proxy method of yourself that you would wait on that would send it to each one of the actors. It would collect the responses and then it would come back. So yeah, you can split it out. It's not there's not as quite of a one liner as it as it is, but you can have it in the function that's actually waiting on the response look like a one liner. Um, so yes, it's possible. Um, so if you need to broadcast things and get things, you can do so. <laughs> So, um, so let's see here. Read the map. Um, what is? Why don't we actually go up to the eight sync hive? So I'm going to go north. Uh, so I'm at the entrance of the eight sync hive. So this is my abstract concept of what um, things actually look like inside of eight sync. Do you see a bunch of actors kind of milling around, and they all have like this umbilical cord attached to them that leads into this dome-like structure, and uh, that's. And that's where all the messages actually come into. So there's actually a meta actor. Um, we can chat with actor here. Um, and they will like complain about things, about uh, going to sleep and stuff like that. Most of the NPCs you can chat with, because I spent way too much time <laughs> messing around here. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, yeah. So uh, but anyway, if I look, we can also go north to go inside of the hive. And that's one of the fun things here. Um, so inside of here, um, it actually looks, it says, full, so it's obvious that everything's kind of goopy. So one thing about, um, this is more significant, I guess, if you are a um, Guile user, but we use the object-oriented system inside of um, Guile that's called Goops. Not everybody really loves it in uh, um, Guile, but I like it because it allows you to actually change and add slots and redefine things without it breaking while the system is running, which I think is important if you want a live hacking environment. Um, now, we, there are some more functional people in the Guile community that are like, ah, oh, you know, it's got too much mutation and stuff like that. Um, well, I submitted a patch that allows, or a there's a function that I have that allows you to actually swap out um, to make clones of things instead of mutating them. I was originally going to have a room inside of this game where you could walk in there and there would be like, it would be like the mutation chamber, and you'd see each actor inside of its own little cell. They send messages at each other, and each one would mutate. And there's like this woman in the corner who's like the function of the program, and she's like, disgusting every time that it mutates. Like, gross. <laughs> and then, like, if you chat with her, she would like, I, I ran out of time for this, unfortunately. She'd be like, follow the white rabbit to see the answer. And you could follow it, and then you'd end up in another room that also has actors inside of these, like, like individual pods. But then, instead of mutating, it, they would clone a completely different but altered version of it and throw the old body on top of the garbage collector that would then get thrown out of heat and just dis <laughs> disposed. And she, she'd be like, ah, oh, so much more humane. But uh, uh, unfortunately, I ran out of time for that. So anyway, um, so it's possible to do kind of more functional things, we replace things, but I don't have it quite in there yet. So inside of this room, we see the, eight, the hive actor itself. So if we look at the hive actor, this is kind of a meta actor that actually distributes messages to all the different actors in the game. And it has an umbrella cord sticking to itself. Um, but the, the um, but, yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, it'll yell at you if you start talking to it. So, um, I hear that fiber system has a nice work ceiling system, but the proprietor is not convinced that our design won't corrupt actor state, that and the actor certain to stripe when it came up last. So, right now, HSync actually will suspend on I.O. So anytime that you would actually be writing something to read or write from a file, it'll automatically suspend it in mid-execution and just be woken back up when there's something available. So you also don't need to split your functions on I.O. bound <laughs> that automatically happens. Um, but uh, it's possible to split it on CPU bound stuff, but we don't. Uh, but that's actually tricky to avoid corruption and stuff like that. So the more fun thing that's in here is a stray message. Um, so look at message. It's floating above the floor for some reason. So if I read the message, due to its bizarre error in space time, the message prints itself out. Okay, so this is actually the message that was sent to the actor asking it to print itself out. Um, so. Uh, if I read it again, it'll switch out the ID for a new one. Um, so what happens is, uh, um, you notice it incremented the number on this side. So 
the way this is basically how it works each message has its own individual id it's sending to some sort of address you can see that this one has its own actor id and a hive id and the hive meta message thing and the player meta message both share the same hive id so they're both part of the same hive um and you can um each one has kind of an action which allows you to kind of specify the method um, so that's very similar to methods on any sort of object as you would have in Python or anything. Um, and these are all arguments that are passed into the message handler. Um, so, and this stuff is just all to make that wait stuff automatically happen. So that's, that's basically the crux of how the message passing works. Yep. So anyway, <laughs> uh, what else do we have to do here in this talk? So let's go south, go south. Um, so here, I'm going to read the map again. Um, Gaile Sink Museum or Federation Station? What's more interesting at the moment? Well, I guess we can cover both of them. Mm -hmm. Arbitrary choice? Let's go to the museum, and then we can go to the secret passage. Okay, let's go to the museum. So, um, go west. A security guard steps aside as we try going through, and then stands in front of the door. Oh, that's interesting. So let's try actually going back east again. And the security guard stops and tells us that the only exit is through the gift shop. Too bad. <laughs> uh, uh, so, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> so it, there's a list of exhibits. So let's look at list. Um, so 2016 progress. So uh, look at 2016 exhibit. This is a giant wall of text, as this whole talk is. Um, I guess. Um, but uh, just as a summary, so the, uh, at the GNU 30th meeting, we started talking about the fact that we needed some sort of asynchronous answer to things. Um, and we, a number of us met up at Veggie Galaxy starting to plan things. Uh, 8 sync came out uh, in kind of late 2015, and early 2016, as well as another person's project, Guile Async. Um, and, uh, um, and then kind of one of the main Guile developers kind of blew everything away by allowing this um, by adding a new feature to Guile called Suspendable Ports. And what Suspendable Ports allow us to do is what I said earlier, where you can write I.O. code. So if you were doing something like where you were doing, you know, you know, while, you know, like something to read in file, you know, read from file, you know, this won't block. Whereas in most code, that loop will just be a busy loop. This will actually just suspend any time that it needs, it doesn't have something to read from it and will allow other actors to continue and, uh, um, and will wake up again as soon as there's something available. So it makes writing network and, and like IO-based code really easy uh, without splitting things up again. So, um, and Andy Wingo started his own library called Fibers, which is um, another library for Guile. So right now, it's not completely clear what the future and whether or not we'll have one or multiple of the high-level APIs. So, um, Let's talk about eight sync and fibers. Guile, I found out after giving this talk from the Guile async author that uh, um, async and fibers are pretty close. So look at eight sync and fibers exhibit. Um, so both of them are pretty similar. If you look at eight sync and you look at fibers, both of them involve using this suspendable ports feature, which is not surprising since Sandy wrote it. Um, both of them use message passing. Um, so what's different about them? Uh, well, fibers can technically has processes. It's using something called the communicating sequential processes. Um, and if you've looked at Go or something like that, it's very similar to Go and those types of designs. So it's in that school of things. But it's the same thing. You're reading from some sort of inbox, except you can read from that inbox at any point in the loop, which also can be a problem because if you have two inboxes and you're reading from one of them and the other one you need to get to at some point, you can end up in live lock. But um, but it has some more. But there are some advantages also to using its idea of CSP, which is a form of process calculi, because it's a little bit more mathy. And uh, but what's nice is that AppSync is based on the actor model, and Fibers is based on CSP. And these are technically for mathy people will use the term dual, and mathy people will get excited about that because it means you can implement each one as in terms of each other. So Fibers probably has a better underlying design because Andy Wingo is way smarter than I am, but that's the gist of it. I'm not going to read the suspendable ports exhibit because I kind of already talked about it enough. So let's look at the actor model. Actor model exhibit. Um, so factoids about the actor model. It's conceived initially by Carl Hewitt in the 1970s, and the idea is that you're supposed to have a society of experts. So each 
um, actor in there is supposed to have some sort of expertise in some sort of domain. Um, and if you t talk to Carl Hewitt about it, he says the actor is the fundamental unit of concurrency. Um, I don't follow that. You know, like his, if you look at Erlang, even numbers are actors. Um, in 8sync, some, an actor can kind of be as large or as lean as you like. Um, but, uh, um, but so anyway, shared nothing. Um, but what's really funny is that actors originally were what Scheme, which is what 8sync is programmed in, um, was designed to explore in the 1970s. Um, and while they were exploring message passing into Lambda calculus, they basically were like, oh, wait a minute, these are exactly the same thing. The Lambda calculus already handles this whole thing, except there's a little bit of a difference in terms of uh, um, how uh, an, an expectation, as in terms of address space, usually when you're dealing with something where it's just like the Lambda calculus, you're expecting that whatever code you call will return to that thing, right? You don't have that guarantee in an asynchronous environment. You might call code, and then suddenly it might never get back or whatever, right? Or it might come back at some sort of completely different time or something like that. So there's a certain amount of different expectation that involves when you have message passing, I think. Um, and uh, so that's, that's one reason why I think the actor model is still valid, despite that it can be seen as very similar to the Lambda calculus. Um, so anyway, uh, Ava said we should see what that thing is below. <laughs> and so let's go south. And we're in the museum gift shop. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is also somewhat of a a, a, a um, cop out because I didn't completely finish it. But so everything's just glued to the walls and you can't take it. But in, in an <laughs> ideal world, you'd be able to punch the frog, get its gold, and come here and buy things. But that's not true. Uh, punch the frog. Uh, anyway, we can go northeast, and now we can go through the revolving door and get back into the laboratory. So there's only one <laughs> more room to look at, um, and that's the Federation Station section. So let's go east. And uh, in this room, you see a bunch of nodes on the walls, and they're all interconnected and glowing as messages pass between them and stuff. And as some of you know, Federation is kind of my main thing. That's what I spend most of my time on, is about decentralizing network environments and stuff. And that's actually what partly got me interested in, in an actor model in the first place. So um, if you have heard of ActivityPub, um, that's the th main thing that I work on with the W3C. So there is, um, it's a standard. You can look at it today. If you're interested in building one of these decentralized networking protocols, you can read this standard. And it explains how to be able to actually federate things as in terms of things going from one endpoint to another. So say you have some sort of Facebook-like alternative, right? And you want to share a note between two different servers. How do you do that? So this is what it actually looks like. It's a simple JSON syntax. You see that you like, this is a like object which comes from this actor, Valerie, and she's sending it to these different, of uh, these other actors, and she, and, it ha and the object that she's liking is a note that says, I'm a goat, right? So, um, but it's pretty simple to read, right? But wait a minute, wait a minute, this seems, oh yeah, oh, that's a funny gif I did not mean to open, but anyway. Uh, uh, the, the basic idea is that you have, each server has an inbox and you're sending messages between them. But doesn't that sound familiar? That sounds an awful lot like what we're doing here. So there's a conspiracy chart. I'm going to read it. Read conspiracy chart. Um, it's all related, shouts the over exuberance conspiracy chart. Activity pub, federation, the actor model, scheme, text adventures, muds. What do these have in common? Merely everything. So on this poster, there's like a bunch of like things drawn on it with all these different names and a red marker highlighting them and drawing lines between them. And uh, it seems crazy, but maybe, maybe it's just crazy enough to be true. <laughs> um, so Scheme, as I said before, was originally started to explore the actor model. Um, and though it became more famous for its work on the Lambda calculus, um, that exploration of the interrelatedness of that um, is at its very heart. The activity pub protocol for Federation, it uses activity streams, which, huh, like, you know, like, it actually looks very similar. You have a pu public uh, uh, subject predicate object type relationship, like, you know, take duck from, from, uh, um, bathtub. from bathtub, uh, is not too far away from, you know, like post by, you know, by Mallory or whatever, right? Um, so it turns out that those are kind of similar in its grammatical structure. <laughs> uh, so, 
Um, so the feder so um, but there's also related with federation and the actor model because both of them involve having nodes that shoot messages between each other. So pretty similar in concept. And Zork, the world's first text adventure, well actually second if you didn't count adventure, uh, but the first major one uh, is uh, um, used muddle as its language, which actually looks almost exactly like Scheme. Um, in fact, it's Scheme pretty much with angle brackets and before it got a little bit more lambda calculus-y. Um, and uh, um, so that has some relationship. And before the 1990s, there was actually this vision that we were going to, instead of reading web pages on the internet, we were going to live in a much more cyberpunk future where everybody was like going from room to room and talking with each other and, you know, like, you know, like Neil Gibsoning, you know, fighting each other in some sort of like electronic hallway or something like that, right? And so there, MUDs were actually a major form of research. Um, and uh, there were a number of uh, um, research labs actually studying them at the time. So for example, uh, the at and Network Lab and I think the Xerox Park Network Lab both had some research projects. And here is a, an article that is talking about building federated MUDs before the federated web started. So anyway, I just think that it's interesting that in a certain sense, none of these things look related, but they're all are kind of related. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's pretty much my talk. The, uh, I hope you got a flavor for how you can build worlds that are alive, try to make network-based environments that you know, can change and be modeled as the world is running, that are easy to kind of thread together, and how in some ways this is kind of related to the various uh, um, decentralized internet things I've been trying to explore. And that's it. Um, uh, thanks, everyone.